Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture five. Remember when I was kind of outlaying the topics for these lectures? I was saying, oh yeah, in the first two lectures we'll cover basically the equivalent of what you know in structural uh, Verilog. You done chisel, and yeah, we've done that, right? We've done combinational logic, we've done sequential logic, finite state machines, whatever you can do it. Um, so basically, anything you do in structural Verilog, you can now do in chisel, and actually it's a little bit better, right? We have a little more parameterization, we have a little more stronger types, that kind of goodness. Uh, so today is really we start taking it further, right? We start saying, okay, what else can we do by taking advantage of having Scala at our availability to help us make more exciting designs? In particular, today is about collections, meaning what happens if we want to have multiple things, right? Uh, rather than just you know writing arbitrary logic one component at a time, what if we work on groups and components? So let's talk about that. Okay, so in particular we're talking about collections. You know, so you know a data structure has multiple things. Uh, so we're talking about those in Scala. We're actually using the Scala ones quite a bit. And then how to make our chisel code make use of those Scala collections. Uh, then there actually are chisel constructs that also are collections. And we'll cover those too. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and load up a notebook. Good to go. All right, so first off, kind of default collection in Scala is something called a seek. So seek is short for sequence. And so it's not only a collection of things, but sequence implies there's some sort of ordering, you know, in there, right? So in other words, uh, it's like, okay, I have, you know, n things, and each of those things is associated with a unique index, right? Um, and so yeah, so a seek, you can go ahead and index with, with premises. So maybe go ahead and start, you know, getting some code alive here. So, you know, let's declare one, sure. You can declare a seek and actually give it initial values, okay. You can access something by giving an index. So I want, like, you know, it starts from zero. So okay, so one's gonna be this one's gonna be two, okay. Um, in the Scala spirit, there's a lot of um, methods available. So you can ask things like, is it empty? Sure. Rather than saying not is empty, you can actually just say non-empty. So it's had both, right? That's very common. Uh, you know, hey, we wonder how big it is. There's a length, sure. Uh, let's say, for example, you were to fill it out. You want to actually not just fill things up from the beginning. Let's say I want three instances of eight. You can do that. No problem. And then, interestingly, you might ask, well, what class am I working with? Uh, the reason why I did this is so you recognize, oh, wait, this is immutable, right? So seeks, uh, if you just declare it without thinking anything about it, in Scala, by default, are immutable. For Scala's collections, um, they often have a immutable one and a mutable one. To keep things uh, clear in this course, uh, I tend to use only one flavor of each collection at a time, right? So for seeks in this class, always immutable. Yes, there's a mutable version if you import it specifically and intentionally turn it on, but don't use that. Uh, and guess what? Scala complainer, if you try to, you know, copy an immutable one to a mutable one, it'll tell you. There's a different type. So you can use a cast, but if you don't use a cast, it's going to yell at you, right? Uh, and later on, we do want a mutable collection. We'll use an array buffer uh, as an example of a, of a mutable collection later on in this course. And so, as a reminder about the mutability, right? Um, so the seek itself is immutable. The val is immutable, right? Now, I could have, you know, a uh, var, and that, that means I can change what that var points to. Um, but even if that var pointed to a seek, that particular seek itself would be unchangeable because the seek itself is immutable, right? Um, cool. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to the Scala Collections Library. It's actually arguably one of the strongest features of the language. And it's well explained. There's a lot going on. You can see it tells you about the you know, mutable versus immutable. Uh, notice how, depending on what you're doing, the Scala 2 versus Scala 3. In this course, we're using Scala 2 because um, Chisel's still using Scala 2. Um, for example, here's an example of the class hierarchy. You can see there's quite a few different uh, things in there, uh, we're using seek, et cetera. Uh, okay, but we can come back to more data structures later on this course. Seek is good enough for today. You may come across code or even executions where you see the word list or vector pop up. Understand that seek is a base class and it's actually abstract. And so the compiler and language actually has to turn it into a concrete class to actually run your code. Uh, list and vector both implement a seek. They have different, you know, performance trade-offs. And I personally tend to find it worthwhile to just use seek all the time. And, you know, there may be a performance penalty by not perfectly choosing list of vector at the right times, but I find just the simplicity of having a single type works great. Um, more experienced Scala and Chisel coders are often much more deliberate about using list or vector to get the exact right uh, collection performance they want. But understand, you know, you may have a large hard design, but the question is how many items are inside your collection. You only have, you know, dozens of things in the collection. 
That won't matter much performance wise. So Seek will be just fine. That's what we're used for this course. Cool. Questions so far? Okay. So then um, another handy thing we're going to want to use is a range. So you've seen this in Python, uh, you know, uh, but it's kind of handy to have you in Scala. So if you want to have a range of numbers, you can simply just say a starting number until and then the ending number. Now, you notice here I have both until and to. So until is exclusive, meaning it will not include that number. If you say two, uh, it will include that number, right? So for example, if I add zero to two, four versus zero until four, you can see that two, four includes the four. Um, you also, of course, can uh, change your increment. By default, it's by one. You can say by two. You can go backwards and say by minus one. That's all fair game. So if you ever find yourself needing numeric range, this is how you do it. Remember that like, much like Python, um, a lot of times you have iterators on collections, you don't necessarily need to have a numeric range. You can get five just fine iterating directly in a collection. You can iterate on the seeks. We'll see that later today. Okay, so let's start putting things together, right? So how about, for example, doing something like a for loop, right? Um, so for loop in Scala can do things like you used to in most for loops. If you really use all those crazy features, you can be much more sophisticated than that. But for starters, okay, let's just do a for loop, right? Let's perhaps iterate over one of those ranges, right? So zero until four. So that's going to go zero, one, two, three, right? Until is exclusive. And just print it out. Sure. Okay. That's cool. Um, well, what else can we do? Well, sometimes with for loops, you actually care about the iteration order and you want to keep track of, you know, the prior iteration or that maybe you won't have like the last iteration reminded or something. Uh, you'll see a pattern of that uh, later on. Sure, you can do that as well. You can use a var. So even though, you know, I try to discourage var for the most part, some of the times I think var is most justified for this course is something like var with a for or a while loop. Um, it tends to be one of the better times most useful. Okay. Uh, and then this last bit of syntax here is kind of interesting. So Scala allows for, I'll make it a little bit simpler actually, where you write for once, and you keep putting clauses, they're like nested force. So here I have four written, the keywords written once, but I actually have two uh, scopes here. So basically it's actually gonna do like the, the cross product, right? It's gonna do all of them, right? So do the outer loop four times and each the outer iteration is the inner loop four times. So that's pretty cool, right? And you can see actually, it's not four times, actually I did it such as like a triangle, right? It does only from I until four rather than from zero to four. But you see the idea, and so this is, this is pretty cool. So you can have some pretty interesting arbitrary four combinations where you write four once and you can nest a lot of variables, have much more rich iteration space, or you saw the code I just hid for a second. Uh, you also can put constraints, right? Hey, I only want the situation. Okay, so in between the iteration space, the cases that add up to four, maybe I want to revert this, allow it to consider the other ones. Okay, get three, one now. This is all possible, right? So it's, it's pretty flexible stuff with four inside Scala. It's actually can be even richer still. It's only just scratching the surface. Uh, it's one of these keywords where you might think, oh yeah, four is like, you know, classic not functional program. But no, you can use four in some pretty cool functional tricks. Um, there's a lot more to it. Uh, as an example, you can go to this link, of course, see like they have four comprehensions. Uh, you can do filters and other stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, great. Everybody on board so far? Okay. Let's go try and use this as a chisel. So let's say the task I want you to build is you want to build the ley line, right? Uh, you might call this the ship register. You know, in other words, you have a bunch of registers where the input of one feeds into the input of the next. And because we're doing things in chisel, we're doing a generator, right? So rather than building this for a fixed depth, we're going to say, you know what? I want to have this parameter n, which tells you how many registers it has to go through. So let's go ahead and try and build one of these, right? So for now, we're not going to worry about bit whips. That's an easy thing to fix later on. We're just assuming it's one bit. That's fine. We can fix that later. But we're going to say, okay, taking an end number of, you know, registers. Okay, I have an input and an output, sure. And then what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to make sure my code works. So I'm going to protect myself and say I require there's at least, you know, one register. If there's a register, this code just as written is going to break. In a minute, we'll actually show an example of where the code is just fine with zero. And that's actually really cool. So what do we need? Well, we need n registers. So for that, we might as well declare n registers, no problem. So we use the seek to hold them. So yeah, we want n instances of reg and we're you know, giving them type pool, sure. Given those registers, what do we do? Well, we connect the first one to io.in. Yeah, this is reg zero over here. 
Then with a for loop, we go connect the rest of them. In this case, we actually deliberately go uh, from one to n. So that way, you know, and then we connect to the prior one. So in other words, we do one minus one at zero to so connect back to the first one. Everything's connected back to their prior one. Then yeah, you gotta do the last one connected to io.out. out. And so this, this does it. Uh, hopefully I convince you this works. Uh, we actually look at the Verilog. Uh, as a brief note, uh, I also decided last night to make a simple shorthand. I kept writing print line, get Verilog so often in this class. Why not just do print Verilog? It's fixed behind the scenes. It's a simple syntactic sugar. But um, anyways, yeah, guess what? We said we want two registers. We can see two registers here inside this code. We go down to one. No problem. We have a generator, right? This is pretty spiffy. Uh, now, zero is going to say I don't meet the requirement, right? But yeah, I could do eight, have a giant thing. Yeah, no problem, right? We, we built a generator. That's pretty neat. Um, cool. So, questions so far? Yes. Uh, I don't believe so. The question was, okay, when we had this expression in the prior slide of the, these combined for loops where it's, you know, basically two loops, but expressed only once. I don't believe there's any performance difference. Um, yeah, I'm not enough a language person to tell you the terminology difference between why they have the key for keyword only once here so you can have it more times. But yeah, occasionally you'll see people do some really crazy stuff where they have a lot of four clauses put together with a lot of ifs doing the two filters and they can do some really sophisticated stuff kind of combining it all together. Yes. Uh, what do we want repeat lines? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's a great point. Okay, so, uh, correct. Chisel does not use GenVar. <laughs> a veteran Verilog programmer could definitely use GenVar. Another thing, that was one of the advantages of Chisel initially was it generated really, really simple Verilog, which the downstream CAD tools really enjoyed, you know, eating up. Um, people kind of thought writing chisel almost like a linter in a way. However, uh, you know, although it's great for tools, humans don't like how verbose this is, right? You could, as I said, you could do a gen bar. Uh, the newest version of chisel, its biggest feature is it has a new backend, which if you give it the right prodding, will turn on a mode where it produces, you know, what it considers to be much more human friendly Verilog. I don't know if it uses gen bar, but it does a lot of other things to make things less redundant. Yes. So GenVar is very uh, unstandardized. Uh, so if, it, if it goes, those who've done Verilog, um, the standard's over a thousand pages, the spec, and there's plenty of behavior that's not specified in that thousand pages. And so you're at the mercy of one CAD tool's implementation of GenVar versus another CAD tool's implementation of GenVar. And so GenVar in a simple case like this will probably behave the same in all the tools, but it's not very hard to inadvertently make a small thing which too seems like an innocuous change. The tools think it's innocuous, but then tool A performs differently than tool B. Cool. Okay, so this first one's pretty neat. Uh, you know, functionally it has what we want, right? You know, we declare it in registers, we connect them all up, we know we connect the corner cases of the first and last, and you know, connect the little ones in the middle. You know, looks pretty nice. Uh, what shortcomings are there? Well, we have to have at least one register, right? So let's say I want to have a really, uh, you know, parameterized generator can handle the case of zero. I would need an if clause to handle that. That's not ideal. Um, otherwise, you know, it's decent. So let's see what else we can do. Can we make this better? Well, we can. What if we use uh, a var, right? Uh, even though I'm encouraging you not use var, here's an example where var used correctly can help make it simpler, right? Um, the thing in the prior slide, if we go back a slide, the reason why we needed at least one is because this for loop has a minus one clause here, right? So zero minus one is gonna be minus one. That's not gonna be okay. Uh, but by having a var, we can be clever, right? Uh, we can use var to hold the last connection. So that way we can start from zero. And so just the zero one, instead of going to minus one, that's actually gonna be grabbing io.in, right? The other thing we're gonna do clever here is it turns out we actually don't need to have a sequence of all the registers. Even though we're gonna have n registers, you don't still need to have a sequence, right? In this case, we're gonna declare them one by one as you go through the for loop. So each time in a way, we're kind of gonna have like a last cons, like a pointer in a way to the most recent register. And every time the iteration uh, of the uh, loop executes, I'm going to make a new register and have that connect to last con and make last con equal to that one, right? So kind of keep adding things onto the tail in a way. Um, and so yeah, this is you know a simpler, tighter code. 
Uh, and if we go ahead and, you know, generate this, it's going to look exactly the same in the output. So even though I've changed the chisel, the resulting Verilog is unchanged. Um, but like I said, the nice part with this one, you know, is there's no require statement, right? I can have NB0, no problem, right? It can just pass straight through. So this is pretty cool, right? This code is uh, a little bit simpler. Uh, it's more flexible, can handle the case of zero. Uh, so this is actually the judicious use of uh, var, right? So this is the one that's, you know, okay, yeah, this, this, this helps. This is good. Um, other questions? So you're going to see throughout the quarter, occasionally we'll do the exact same module multiple times, kind of tweaking it and using new language features and making it subtly better. And sometimes, like I said, you saw that last time where I, you know, was using that really spiffy register thing, like what a really long line. Sometimes you go too far and it's too dense. In this case, I think it's still improving. The prior one wasn't bad. This one, I think it's still an improvement though. Um, okay. So... Let's put four to work, right? So if you remember from lab one, you've already had to do this, where I asked you to like write a lot of combinations out, right? You know, for testing, it seems like, gee, if it's brute force combinational testing, that should just be a for loop, right? Here we go. Let's do that for for loop. In particular, notice how we set this up, right? Here's some combinational logic on the left. You know, this could be anything. But the key thing is we want to do combinational logic of three Boolean values, right? So or technically the bools when they're in chisel, right? Uh, what do we do? Well, we want to consider if they're you know, true or false, put those in the seeks and iterate through those, right? So basically, you know, three nested for loops, we can iterate through all those. Um, there we go. Uh, and yeah, we can go ahead and you know, poke the values in for A, B, and C. Added a print line here so we can you know, see what happens. Uh, and then we go ahead and um, check the expect. Uh, okay, so we go ahead and do this. Oops, I should declare the module first. There we go. Um, so what are we printing? Well, in this case, we're printing the input cases, not the output of the circuit. Let's say we actually wanted to print the output of the circuit, and we added a printf, right? Uh, then we run this, you're like, wait, where's my printf at? We covered this, right? The printf in the Chisel designs only value once per clock cycle and never advance time, right? So this one, the print line worked just fine because it's the Scala print line. So every iteration loop, the Scala print line is evaluated. This printf is, you know, put into the hardware design. It's not gonna put in the real hardware in physically, but in simulation, it still exists. However, that print's only gonna be evaluated once per clock cycle. So unless if I want to actually have that print do something, I need to actually advance time. So that depends. If you're doing purely combinational work, you don't need to advance the clock. You can just change the inputs, check the output right away. However, if you want to do things like waveforms or printf, you're going to want to step it. Yes. Oh, good question. So um, we could do it that way, right? The, 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 the catch would be we would need to, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, sometimes it's easier to put things in the module and that way it's easy multiple tests. But in this particular example, uh, you might notice that um, here are the inputs. We actually want the output, right? So now I'm going to try this. I've never done this before. Let's go ahead and uh, try to grab that output, right? That out, that peak. Yeah, okay, it does come out. <laughs> there, there we can see it. Now you can do some more formatting so that may look prettier, right? But yeah, uh, that'll work, right? So peak lets you read the value of a signal. And like I said, you actually technically don't need to call a clock that step, right? Because the simulator is smart enough where if you change inputs to combinational block, it's going to evaluate the simulation to compute the new combinational outputs accordingly. So you can, you know, continuously kind of be changing inputs and outputs, and the combinational thing should change right away. It's only the things that go through registers that take a cycle to propagate, right? Um, cool. Other questions? While we're having fun, let's try out that force syntax, right? What if we evaporate all this stuff. Um, oops, I got put semicolons, don't I? And then we need fewer of these. I don't know, we can debate if you think this looks prettier. Hopefully this works. Yes, it does. Okay, yeah, so that's the simpler for syntax. I don't know, is that more clear, is that prettier? Maybe, maybe, actually, I don't know, it's less nothing. 
Cool. More questions. So you can see what we're doing today, right? We're taking these constructs of like things like seek and for, and we're now building up. We're getting more sophisticated, more automation, right? We have a generator like this prior thing, right? They can build an arbitrary number of registers. That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty flexible. And then meanwhile, here you're using for loops to build you know, more sophisticated testers, right? In any language, if you find yourself doing a lot of copying and pasting, that's probably a mistake. For that lab that's question, you probably did a lot of copy pasting. That was kind of intentional. But normally, you know, you want to do programmatically. So use a for loop, right? Or in this case, three for loops nested. Cool. Okay. So then if folks have no more questions, we can jump right on to chisel vec, which is the chisel component for uh, a collection. Now, I'm going to keep talking about this over and over again. I think it's a like common point of confusion with students, but I, I think we can do this, right? So seek is a Scala collection. And as you saw in the hardware example, right? That's usually sufficient, right? You can, as you're building a design, right? Remember chisel, at the end of the day, you're instantiating things and connecting things, right? And so uh, with a seek, that helps you what you want to do, right? You can instantiate a bunch of things, put them into a seek, and then you can access them to connect them. Works just fine, right? Um, it helps the majority of the cases. There are a handful of cases where in the hardware, you want the hardware thing itself to be dynamically addressable, right? In other words, like, you know what? I, you know, want the hardware to select which element out of this array, so to speak, right? For that, you need a VEC. The other time you use a VEC is when you want to have a parameterized number of ports, which is done with that mechanism we described, right? And so the syntax is not too crazy, right? VEC, number of elements, the type. And like I said, a lot of times you're going to have your Scala collection of a lot of students kind of get a mindset of, oh, I'm writing chisel, let's use VEC. I'm like, you probably can use seek. And you probably, not just can, but you should use seek. You should only use VEC when you really need to use VEC. Now, the thing about VEC that uh, is interesting when it comes to teaching this and learning this is you need to realize from the point of view of the chisel language developers, VEC is, not a, uh, is a type. It's not a physical thing, right? So rather than thinking this is like a dynamic array, think of this as a type. Um, and so the reason why that distinction matters is let's say you want to have a bunch of registers addressable by a VEC. The way you do that is you actually declare the VEC and you wrap that as a reg, right? In other words, it's a register. The type the register happens to hold is a register of, of type VEC. And the VEC itself could be, you know, num elements number of a certain type. You might wonder, well, what if I did a vector of registers, which, you know, also would make sense. Uh, if you accept the notion that VEC is a type, not a physical thing, then you see why the other uh, 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 order of events is not allowable. And Earlier versions of the chisel, like chisels one and two, did allow, you know, VEC of reg and reg of VEC. Chisel three, you know, years ago, said, no, 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 just reg of VEC. And like I said, if you buy into this notion that VEC is not a, a physical thing, but it's a type, it makes sense. And so that same mentality, right, uh, you have like a wire, right? You can have a wire of a VEC. You cannot have a VEC of wires, right? And so, yeah, it's a little bit philosophical, but you can think about it, right? Like, you know, a register or a wire is a, you know, tangible thing. Now, technically right now, it's still in software, but when it's manufactured, it's a tangible thing. Meanwhile, like a uint, that's a concept, it's a type, right? It's not actually a tangible thing. You can't touch a uint. You can touch a uint as a wire or a uint as a register, but you can't actually touch a uint. It's the same mentality for VEC, right? You can't touch a VEC. You can touch a VEC instantiate as a register or a wire, right? Um, like I said, the reason why to me it's not a perfect uh, mental model is just because you know, if you actually dynamically address, that VEC is going to have a mux, right? But that detail aside, uh, this is the kind of way it makes sense. Before I show an example on the right, we will pause for questions. It's kind of a deep, deep concept right here. Okay, so then what happens uh, if I try to... Um, do something let's say like make a mux. There's a question from you know last week lectures. Well, if I want a mux of arbitrary number of ports, we can build one, right? So this is a mux that has n ports, and just because we can, uh, each of them is w bits wide, right? So you can see, for example, the input is a vec. We talked about one of the use cases for vec is parameterized number of ports. So I have n ports, each one is w bits wide. Now for select signal, to select between you know n things, I need log two bits. Okay, this is not a one hot encoded mux. Uh, and then the output, okay, it's W bits wide. 
Uh, and then what else do we have? Okay, well, we can, it's actually really simple, right? Vex, right? You just use, you know, array indexing style. So, you know, in Scala, most seeks and Vex, you index into them with curly braces, not square braces, like a lot of other languages. Yeah, so simply just of the inputs, select it, right? It actually couldn't be simpler. And then what is that in the Verilog? Well, here it's doing the, you know, automatic implementation using a lot of two-to-one muxes. To make this bigger, you know, it'll keep using more two-to-one muxes in this kind of, you know, unbalanced uh, linear tree. Um, now it's interesting, of course, it sets it automatically setting the number of selection bits correctly, declaring all the input bits. So this is really neat. We have a nice little compact syntax here. Someone in our design library wants to use this mux. All they got to do is say that, and then they get the right number of ports they want, select bits at the right size. Oh, yeah, I don't want one bit. I want four bits wide. Boom, no problem. Comes out right away, et cetera. Yes. Oh, it's definitely cascaded. Now, here's the thing. So it's a great question. You're saying, wait a second. I don't know, you know, cascading six muxes, isn't that like bad for critical path or something? Uh, believe it or not, and this is one thing that surprised me, uh, every cat that we've come across does the right thing with this. So it's like, oh, you have six muxes cascaded? I know what you want. I can do the right combination of trees or four to one, six to one muxes. It'll solve it. So it actually optimizes this really well. Now, it's an interesting anecdote. So for research, like I said, in my research group, we built something called Essent, which is a simulator for fertiles. Take the output of Chisel and build a really high-speed simulator. It's the fastest simulator out there. And so guess what? When Chisel is producing these unbalanced mug trees, let's say you have not just eight things in your back, you have a thousand things in your back. It actually produces a thousand two-to-one muxes in that, like, unbalanced cascade formation. So for years, when that goes into the plus code, when are generating from a simulator, like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a huge slowdown. We determined it actually was such a small fraction of the overall design. It wasn't that much of a slowdown. And actually recently we profiled it and actually found out that for whatever reason, Clang, when given a thousand lines of plus code like that, unbalanced, does the right thing. It actually turns into an array and that indexes it. So I have no idea who deck in the Clang community or LLVM made the optimization pass, but it exists. And so, yeah, this, this expression isn't ideal, but uh, top three compilers like Clang now handles it. But even for years before that, in Verilog, at least Bovado, iVerilog, um, and, you know, AC tools did the right thing. But you're right, it's not, once again, it's an example I said before of chisel historically, the output is not the way humans would write things. This is an example of how not the way humans would write things, right? But the tools have no problem. Oh, yeah, no problem. I understand what you want, and they can, they can figure it out. Great point. Cool. Okay. So then let's keep going. Uh, so speaking of unbalanced trees, let's say I want to build a reduction. Once again, Unbalanced, right? We're going to have, you know, uh, n minus one of these, right? So if I want to do reduction, have, you know, uh, n inputs and add them together, I'm going to use n minus one adders. Now, we know we could do a, a tree to make this more efficient. We'll do that later in the quarter. But for now, we'll do it like this. So how, can we, how do we go about building this? Well, uh, we're going to have, you know, n ports. Use a vec. Sure, sure, we can do that. Output, we're going to say is w bits y, so potentially some overflow lost. Okay. Uh, we're going to require n be at least... One, uh, I don't know what it means to reduce on zero numbers. It's not clear what that means conceptually. Um, and we're going to use that mutable for loop approach we saw earlier, right? So we have a var. We're going to keep track of the prior thing. And just like we saw at the delay line, just kind of keep, you know, adding things together. And that should work, right? So let's see what we get. Uh, yeah, so for example, the two things, two bits, no problem. If I start adding, let's say, more things, we start, you know, adding more addition terms. But yeah. This works. So this works. This is this is reasonable code. Um, and yeah, this nice part is Vex helping us a lot here. Vex lets us have this, you know, parameterized number of ports. Uh, you know, so yeah, so if I have n w bit u int, that's the same number of bits as if I had, you know, n times w uh, bits. Now, if I had a really massive u int, this would not be quite as useful, right? Because I have to kind of do a lot of, like, selection of bits to get individual numbers out. I can count in all those inputs. Keeping them as a vec makes their life a lot easier, right? That way we can say, you know, oh, I want in zero or in one to actually set, you know, these particular uh, inputs and that sort of stuff. And so here we said, we, we now have a parameterized interface and we're taking advantage of that. We can have an arbitrary number of inputs. If the other things are ready for us, perhaps also in our design, you know, we also have that end variable and we're connecting these two things together and they can fit together well. Cool. Questions? Let's go ahead and try to, uh, oops, uh, improve on this, right? Oops, no, we can't improve on this, but 
Uh, we'll see later on. We'll come back to some of these examples canonically throughout the quarter, and you'll see some small code tweaks. Okay, let's see what else we can do. Uh, so when it comes to a VEC, you might uh, want to uh, give it like a um, initial content, right? So you can see, for example, if I go back a slide, right? Um, where in this example, the VEC was the input, so it's already kind of filled in for us. In this example, the VEC was the input, so it's already kind of filled in for us. Oops, that's, that was, was deleted. Um, now, but what if we ourselves want to fill in the VEC? So as an example, one thing you might want to do with a generator is actually to generate a lookup table, right? So in hardware, there are some computations you can build a arithmetic unit to compute. But if you know the computation is really expensive and you only care about you know, a reasonable number of data points, it's often easier to build a ROM or a read-only memory to hold those values for us, right? So using our generation tool flow, what we're going to do is we're going to have parameters of various features we want. And then at you know, generation time, we're going to generate that table and then turn it into hardware. And so then we're going to pass it off to the CAD tool to say, yes, here we go. I want to have you know, a table that's you know, this many entries, and here we do hard-coded values for that table. And they'll make that directly, right? And so in this case, uh, we're going to you know, arbitrarily pick the problem of I want to divide by X and tell you basically true or false if that number is divisible by X, right? So X, in this case, uh, you know, is a, a parameter given to us. It says some hard-coded numbers inside here. Normally, we like to have everything be parameterized, but for making the slide not super complicated, we did that. Okay, so from 0 to 15, what divides, you know, what, what, what can X evenly divide? Well, we're going to do that comparison right there. So you can see right here, for example, we are doing the module remainders, making sure it's 0. So this is, a at this point, a Scala operation, right? And then we're casting it to a chisel bool. And we're building up a sequence of um, these results. Now, let's, let's study syntax a little bit more carefully here. Seek is a collection. Uh, it's a generic, meaning the type of thing it takes internally can be set, right? In the prior example so far, we've not set that explicitly. We kind of trust the type of person to do the right thing. In this case, we need to be explicit about what type is going to be inside there. In this case, we're going to tell it, hey, I want you to have a bool as your type. And the reason why we had to do this is because we didn't give any elements to start off with. If you give uh, some starter elements, it knows what you want, right? So for example, if I let's do a quick example over here, um, if I say seek of two, it's going to know I want uh, you know, an integer. In this case, like I said, it mapped it to a concrete type of a list, but it can infer I want an integer. If I don't give it that, it doesn't know what type to put there, right? Uh, I also could, you know, give it two and say, you know what, make this a double. And that's going to cast it, I believe. Let's find out. Yes, right? So like I said, the, 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 that, that square bracket is available for one of these generics. If you give it enough information, you can often infer it. But in this case, because we have an initially empty collection, uh, we are not able to have that inference. We're going to give it explicitly. The other thing to notice is, wait a second. Uh, I'm starting off empty collection, and eventually I'm going to build it up. So how am I building it up? Well, uh, a seek is itself immutable, right? However, I can build a seek of seeks, and so that's what we're doing here. We have a var, and we start off with an empty seek, and then we keep appending things onto it. So um, Scala has these cute little operators here. This is the append operator, uh, and so this is taking the current seek and adding an element onto it. So we're not changing the seek. We're making a new seek with one more element added onto it. And the reason why we can do that is because the thing we're using to hold this thing is a var, right? If, it, if this was a val, I couldn't do this because I would keep overwriting the val and it's not allowed, but it's a var, it's okay. Um, what's interesting is you can actually, this is the append operator. You also can prepend if you swap the order like this, right? But we actually want appending behavior in this case. This operator is not common in our languages, but uh, the more you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. It's kind of nice. The notion is you have a colon and then a plus. So the colon goes on the side that has the um, collection. Because it's kind of like you have multiple boxes or multiple things. So in this case, we have a collection being appended by an item. So it's colon plus. Uh, and so if I want to prepend an item onto a collection, it would be, you know, it would be uh, plus colon. Oops, I don't know why it keeps hitting the wrong button. Uh, it would be plus, you know, colon. Now, it's interesting to see two collections. You want to concatenate them. It's colon, colon, because both sides 
our collection. So that's another thing, little side on the punctuation of Scala's uh, operators. We haven't seen that before. It's interesting. It's, it's some nice things in language. Um, cool. So wait, what have we done? Well, we've made the collection, 16 elements long. It holds a bunch of chiseled bools of the outcome of what happens in this operation. Right? That's the for loop. We're helping iterating through all this. And then guess what? We just list of, you know, 16 bools. Give it the vec in it. And now we're going to have a vector that, you know, as those literals attached to it. And then now the input can then index into that vector. Or that vec, I should say, rather than vector. Vec, I'm sorry. Um, so boom, uh, we have it, right? And then if we go ahead and set this stuff up, we can generate it, right? And so what have we done? Well, like I said, uh, for a lot of these things, it's going to be, you know, one or zero. And you see in some cases, actually, it was hard to actually even, uh, you know, do math on whether to check the prior result or to uh, keep going based on this stuff. But the, the, the key thing to kind of note is rather than ignoring the Verilog momentarily, it's just, here's an example, right? Uh, we built a lookup table. And this is something that would be kind of annoying to do in Verilog, right? You, you can use Genvar as we talked about before, but like we're actually doing code execution here. So in this case, it's trivial, right? We are doing division. But you can imagine more sophisticated complex operations. You can write arbitrary Scala code that could never be put into hardware, but you can you know, save those results into a table, make a ROM, boom. Yes, questions? Yeah, exactly, same question. So once again, we're gonna keep picking the Verilog and you're right to do so. Uh, this Verilog does not use array. Like I said, like the original chisel output for Verilog has been you know, the simplest, lowest common denominator of Verilog, right? So no arrays, no system Verilog, no gen vars. It's like super vanilla based Verilog to have maximum tool compatibility and the least questions. Um, Yes, the newest version of Chisel, uh, when trying to human readable mode, can use a lot of features. It uses the aggregates, uses some Verilog, uh, uses arrays, uses Genvar. I don't know about Genvar actually, but it does use arrays and aggregates for sure. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, people spend time looking at Verilog, did not like the output of this version of Chisel. But remember, this Verilog is not written for you. It's written for the tools. And if you do your flow correctly, in my opinion, you should never be looking at the Verilog, right? I know you think, oh, I should look at it for debugging. Minimally, minimally, right? How often do I have people plus program look at assembly? If the compiler works, basically never, right? And so same is true here. Yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna repeat this for the recording. Uh, the, the counterpoint to my point was, well, suggested by a student. Well, what if you're doing physical design? Wouldn't you have to look at the Verilog then to do constraints? Maybe? Guess what? Sci-fi put considerable effort into making the Verilog prettier for humans. They have, you know, a good cost accounting uh, methodology in their strategy, so I'm sure they saw value in this, right? So uh, my understanding was actually more so probably verification and physical design, but those people spent a lot of time looking at the Verilog, and the humans found their time was being eaten up by this, you know, more verbose, less, you know, nice Verilog. Uh, currently, no, unfortunately, yes. The question was, let's say I, you know, have a massive chisel design, turn the chisel into Verilog, pass it to a, a big CAD tool, and then later on, look at the CAD tool output, and you know, I know certain things are critical paths, but if you know the Verilog name rather than the chisel name, how to figure it out. Um, yeah, that's, that's a tricky problem. Uh, and actually, even just in Verilog, sometimes, depending on which CAD tools you're using, even the net names themselves get mangled from the Verilog names by optimizations. And so, Yes, associating a low-level hardware design um, output with a high-level language. This is a recurring problem. I've dealt with in a few different languages in my uh, career. This is a common problem with transpilers, right, from language A to language B. You do evaluation in language B. How do you know what happens in language A? Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, I have some work. Not I have some work. Uh, people here at Santa Cruz have some research looking into trying to use tools to help with that because it's a known problem. Cool, uh, let's keep going. Oops, get out of that box. So we've seen a few different uh, examples today. We tried, you know, uh, seeks and vex. Uh, then there's a mem. Now, uh, mem is of course short for memory. And so many of you in the back of your mind are probably thinking like SRAM, right? Uh, you would not be alone in thinking that. 
Uh, mem actually isn't quite necessarily that. So mem uh, is a few things, right? So number one, it is stateful, so it's not just a wire, but it has a combinational read, so zero cycle delay to get the values out. So think of a mem more as like a law of registers with a mux rather than thinking of it as like, you know, uh, a SRAM. The writes are clocked, you know, so there's a one cycle delay to do a write, but zero cycle delay, delay to do a read. Let's say you know you want an SRAM, you know you know you want a cycle a latency, that's a sync read mem. Now actually both mem and sync read mem, you actually can control the delay parameters. It can be arbitrary delays. It's just if you use the constructs without any other arguments, what do you get? Mem, combinational read, in other words, zero cycle delay, you get, you get a zero cycle delay, you get value right away. So it's like you have just the mux ring of register. Um, synchronous write, it is going to registers. And yeah, you can play with these, right? Now, what's interesting with these mems is that a lot of times they make our life easier, right? So even though this is not necessarily going to be SRAM, um, there's times when you have what would be a reg of VEC. Reg of VEC works great. There's a lot of times when you can, it's even tidier still by using a mem. Uh, and it's not just for your code expression, it's also in a downstream tool flow. Uh, the chisel and fertile tools can scale better with mems than they can with uh, large VECs. So if you want to have, let's say, like, Fairy 2000, these things. Um, a Fairy 2000 element mem and Fairy 2000 element vec are both possible, but the mem's gonna be a lot happier in the tools. Also, to the earlier question, uh, a mem will use fair log arrays. So that makes them look prettier already. So like, you'll, you'll see that in a second. Um, when it comes to accessing these mems, now mem, you can declare, of course, you need to read or write to it. You can make as many ports as you want. The ports can be either declared implicitly or explicitly, we'll show both examples of both. Now remember, let's say you're actually hoping to use SRAM. Well, in that case, you're going to use a sync read mem. But even then, uh, you know, if you have too many ports, that's not okay for your memory. So make sure when you have add ports, you know, matches the technology you're trying to map to. Uh, for things like on FPJs using BRAMs or block RAMs, yeah, if you have a sync read mem and you keep the number of ports you use low enough, the t uh, the Verilog emitted will be passed on to like a ASIC, uh, sorry, a FPJ flow like Vivado. And Vivado will correctly infer its BRAMs. That's great. Life is easy. But a lot of designs, if you really can't remember you're using, you're probably going to use some intrinsics to say, I want, you know, this exactly provided, you know, SRAM for the exact, you know, dimensions, whatever, you'll do that. But MEM is still a great default for a lot of things. It's good to get started. And then perhaps later on, you're doing advanced physical design, you'll probably map to an exact memory you know you want for the exact chip or something. And if you really need to, do things like write masks as well. Okay, let's see some examples, right? So let's say uh, you're processor designers, right? So... Uh, one of the key parts of a processor is the register file. So let's do a RISC-V register file, right? Uh, so hey, let's say I want 32 64-bit registers. And I um, want to have two read ports and one write port, right? It's what you need for your canonical RISC pipeline, right? You want to be able to you know, do an instruction. Some instructions need two arguments. Some only need one. So that's why you need two read arguments, two read ports. And then, of course, I'm going to write back the result. That's why I need that one write port. So... Yeah, you see things like I need to give the register, you know, 0 to 31 for the, you know, the two read arguments. Um, if I'm doing a write, I need to get that register as well. Now, you're not always doing a write, so you want to write enable to see if you should turn it on or not. If you're doing a write, of course, you care about the data. And then there's also the output of, you know, what did you actually read out of things. Okay. Um, now, if we look at uh, this design here. Uh, what do we see? Well, okay, we can go ahead and declare reg of vec. Like I said, not vec of reg, reg of vec. Sure, you know, we want 32 uh, elements, each of 64 bits. I can register them. And then, yeah, I can go ahead and read them really easily. So I'm using the implicit read ports in this case. So regs, here's the read address for each one, the two, two read ports, and then the write port. Here's an interesting bit of syntax. Um, I've so far told you, oh yeah, when is like a, a, a mux? Well, in this case, actually I'm putting the write inside the when statement. So this is one of those implicit ports where it's kind of like I'm just directly accessing it. So yeah, as you can see, this is actually only going to write when the write enable is true. So this is kind of a way of using when to actually get the things. So in some ways, it's perhaps more clear syntax, right? It's like very clear what's going on here if you start buying into chisel world of, oh yeah, you know, when, and now when is being used to control the write port. Let's go ahead and flush this out. And yeah, oh my gosh, right? We just talked about this, right? Here's that VEC being turned into 60, you know, 32 discrete regs. Here's all the muxes that access them all. 
oh, right? Why did I do this to myself, right? Like I said, so hardware-wise, you know, we hope the CAD tools will recognize, you know, this massive mux, uh, two to one mux if you do the right thing. It usually does, but can we do better? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and use that mem, right? Uh, and then let's go ahead and rerun this. Look, it's using the array syntax, and this thing's way shorter, right? <laughs> like I said, so it's probably gonna be the exact same hardware with most CAD tools coming to the other end, but guess what? The time to run the chisels faster, <laughs> the time to generate the code faster, the very long shorter. Now, there is some complexity here, because now they're using a mem, you gotta think about the various you know, ports associated with a, with a mem, but that, that's okay, right? And you can see, for example, oh yeah, like here's like the write enable being applied, right? You only apply the write in that case. The reads are combinational, so it can do those anytime it wants to, like right here. Oh boy, get some nice rainstorm going on outside. All right, cool questions. Yes. Oh, really good question. Uh, and it even comes up without a sync read, man. Uh, if I have reads and writes that have overlapping addresses, what the heck happens? Uh, very good point. So uh, that's one of the things that's kind of changed in Chisel, and they've actually really done a good job of standards in the last few years. So the short answer is it's configurable. Um, so I actually, to be honest, do not know the default behavior if you don't set the argument. But if this something that's concerning to you, yes, yeah, for both mem and sync read mem, you can give the arguments for what happens when you have read and write to the same address. Uh, usually, I believe you'll get the old value, but it's worth double checking. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet my life on that one. And that's a good point. This happens all the time. When you have you know, multiple read ports and multiple write ports, like which one do you get? This is the thing to be concerned about. Yeah. Cool. Other concerns. Okay. So then we'll see what else we can do. Um, well, what if, well, here, here's the version of the mems. Uh, so that we, we just saw that a second ago. We like it, it's cleaner. Um, now what if I wanna have a parameterized number of ports, right? Hey, we learned that today, right? We know about VEX, let's do that. So we're gonna have n read ports, one write port. Okay, let's do that, right? Uh, n read ports, one write port. Um, very doable, right? Uh, we have a VEC. So the number of read ports, each one of them a certain size. Now it's not just a VEC for the, um, the VEC for the addresses, but also a VEC for the outputs, right? And then yeah, you can see, okay, well how do we set this all up? Well, we're gonna use the mem, makes things kind of nice and tidy. Uh, now for each one of those read ports, we're gonna use a for loop to actually connect it, right? So each read port, we're going to, you know, uh, read out of that mem. And we have a single write port. You can imagine doing, you know, K write ports, you could also do that just fine as well. And then of course, yeah, this works, right? So I want to have four read ports. Oh my gosh, yes, I can have four read ports. It's that easy to write that uh, in Chisel. So you can see, already today we're doing some things where not a whole lot of code, not a whole lot of complexity, but very flexible, right? These are generators, that's the whole point, right? We're, 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 the point is we're, we're writing code to avoid human effort later on. Now as discussed, maybe we'll, this definitely will be function correct, but what if I'm really worried performance? Maybe I need to make some certain design changes to make, you know, a 10 port register file, you might need to do that. But it's not so much building a register file this way, it's more just about showing examples of here you can do things by taking advantage of having a language like Scala, but in other words, just having an actual language to run some code to figure out what you're actually doing, right? So in this case, right, what are we doing, right? We're instantiating all of the, the registers here, right? And then uh, we're simply just going through systematically connecting things, right? So as we said, right, we're gonna instantiate things and then connect them in this case, for connections, we're going to be guided by a for loop to actually do this, you know, an arbitrary number of times. So you can do it zero to, you know, n times, whatever we need to do. Actually, I'm curious. Will this work with zero? Let's find out if anything breaks. Uh, it seems to have pruned the right port. So uh, yeah, maybe I'll say that's a fail then, right? Uh, and conceptually, I don't know why that would break it, right? Um, I guess maybe it realizes nothing ever, it might be pruning because nothing ever reads it. It's like dead code. There is a DCE or dead code elimination pass inside Fertile, so I bet you maybe what it's doing is, oh yeah, nothing's reading the output, so why should I keep it? So that might be what's happening. Because yeah, one port, it, it right port back, so. Like an ACAD tool, right, if you have dead code, it will get pruned, so. 
be careful of that if you're trying to do certain experiments. Cool. Other questions? All righty. So um, this is the summary slide I made, and this is the common question that I want to help drive these points home, right? So in today's lecture, you see me use seeks. We've also used VEC and even just a second ago MEM, right? So which one should you use when? Uh, most common is actually going to be seek, right? It's a good way to kind of ha keep handle things. Like I said, like in Chisel, when you're writing it, you're instantiating things and you're connecting things, right? And so a seek's a great way to hang on to those things until you connect them the way you want. Sometimes you can connect multiple things. You don't even need to have a sequence, right? You saw that with our second version of our delay line earlier in today's lecture where we had a for loop. We didn't need to have a seek for that, right? We actually found that if we used that var, we had enough things to remember, and that was sufficient, right? Um, like I said, so it's very often a case where you have, you know, n things you're holding onto while you're generating, and you perhaps you want to index them. Sure, a seek can do that, right? You only need the vec if you want that addressing and indexing to be done by hardware while it's actually running. Not at elaboration time, but actually in the physical hardware. The other example, of course, we saw was, you know, when you want to have an arbitrary number of ports or something. Really nice. And other times, you know, you really want memory. Like, I want to have SRAMs. I want to have BRAMs. I think BRAMs your friends. Cool. Other questions? Okay. Before we wrap up, I want to just give a couple of logistics points. So, uh, we're moving along just well. And people are doing great. When you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask them on Slack. Uh, on Slack, not only can I answer them, but also perhaps your classmates can also answer them. Uh, now we can have that. And also, I prefer to answer questions on Slack because that way, the question and answer response I have with a student can be seen by other students. And they may have the same question and can learn from that. Um, additionally, uh, you know, homework one was earlier in the week. Good job, folks. Homework one is due tonight. Uh, I posted homework two. It's actually due next uh, Monday. We're moving along quite fast in this course. Um, uh, lab two uh, is primarily about Wednesday and today. There's like one thing, seek.tabulate, if it's confusing in the lab. I'm covering that on Monday's lecture. But... You can probably figure it out if it's not. Um, and then uh, homework two will be posted probably tonight or tomorrow. It'll be due next Friday. Cool. Any last questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, in three days. Yeah. The goal is to have one homework and one lab per week. Um, and so, yeah, usually the labs, you won't have a full week for them because the point is supposed to be a quick assignment just to kind of get you ready for the homework. I'll try to give you close to a full week for the homework normally. Yes. Oh, question. So is the auto graded grade your final grade? Uh, potentially. Uh, for homework, well, for lab one, there was a couple of issues where we knew there's an auto grade issue. That's why I've not posted the grades. Is I will have to go in and like maybe manually do some things. Uh, in general, whenever the grade ends up on Canvas is your, you know, intended final grade. If something comes up that you believe makes us wrong, please speak to us. We'll see what we can do about it. I said, I've not propagated the grades from lab one, so I had a note to fix some manual cases. But normally it'll be auto graded, and normally I'll just propagate the auto graded grades to Canvas, barring any other issues. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So for both the labs and the homeworks, you cannot submit and complete things that have the auto graded run. That is correct. You need to finish it all. So the way to think of it is, do not consider the auto grader tests your development tests, right? You should be writing your own tests, um, right? Um, the auto grading is grading, right? So, you know, I expect the average student might use the auto grader three or five times per time. You know, you submit it, you have like one thing wrong, you change it, oh, I didn't fix it, okay, try one more thing, okay, now you're done. Three, three submissions, you're done. If you find yourself doing, you know, 100 submissions to the auto grader, that's not what the auto grader is intended for. It's also gonna be a lot of your time. The auto grader is not super fast, right? So you've a lot of waiting time for you. So. Definitely, especially for the homeworks, you're going to want to have a lot of tests yourself locally. Run those, have high confidence in those. As you've all experienced, if your code does not compile, the auto grader does not run, right? And so you don't get a whole lot of feedback because you don't know what even happened. Um, cool. Other logistics questions? Okay, great. All right, we'll see you all on Monday.